uh, we have uh, Varsha Kulkarni, who will talk about mining for metals at Cosmic Dawn. Hi, uh, can you guys see this and hear me? Uh, yes. Yes, okay, all right. Thank you so much. So, all right, hello, I'm Varsha Kulkarni and I'm from the University of South Carolina. I'd like to begin by first of all, thanking uh, both Sarah and Jawe for organizing this uh, very exciting conference. Um, very happy to hear all these uh, wonderful talks. And I'd like to uh, acknowledge a couple of, a few of my collaborators, Suraj Powdell, who is a grad student who just uh, graduated. Um, also, uh, Debopam Shom and Francie Cashman, who are also former students and are now at Space Telescope. And several other people, Celine Peru, Sean Morrison, Brenda Fry and a current student, uh, Jiang Ho Wan. So I'm going to talk about mining for metals during the cosmic dawn with high Richard quasars. And I'm going to talk both about uh, surroundings of quasars, so gas around quasars, but also going further out to probe the global uh, cosmic chemical evolution with quasars. Okay, so here's my outline. I'll give a very quick introduction and then talk about absorbers near high Richard quasars and then global chemical evolution, and then finally, relative element abundances. So uh, here is a simulation for the hydrogen, neutral hydrogen gas and metals at redshift of around five, and uh, in a region 12 megaparsecs by 12 megaparsecs by 10 kiloparsecs. And uh, one can see that the H1 is very filamentary. Uh, the metals tend to follow that uh, to some extent, but they're also, they also occupy a very narrow, very small, Cross section on the sky, um, and what that means is it's hard to hard to probe them, and so DL is along the sight lines to background quasars that offers the most efficient way to probe these dense regions. And one can see that uh, that I'm sorry. I'm sorry. one can see that the range of metallicities uh, predicted goes down to at least a thousand, maybe even lower. But there are regions that are substantially metal rich as well. So uh, this is in, indeed what we do. We take a background quasar, and uh, the quasar sight line goes through circumgalactic as well as intergalactic medium. And uh, that can allow us to trace both inflows of metal poor intergalactic gas as well as outflows of chemically enriched gas back into the IGM through this EGM. And uh, we are all familiar with this uh, wonderful. Uh, representation of quasar absorption lines here, but you have the laminal for forest, and uh, this is a damp laminal for absorber. Associated with that are many metal absorption lines. And with high resolution spectrographs, you can study these lines in detail and uh, determine their chemical, uh, determine the composition, the column densities of various metals, as well as the velocity structure of the absorption systems. One thing, however, one has to be careful about is to use elements that are not sensitive to dust depletion. And that is, uh, the reason for that is obvious from this picture here, showing depletion as a function of condensation temperature. And you can see that a number of elements, including elements like silicon, chromium, iron, etc., can deplete uh, substantially on interstellar dust within the Milky Way and other galaxies. And of course, this is an example of cool gas, but even in warm gas, uh, you can have substantial depletions. So one has to choose elements like uh, oxygen, for example, or sulfur, or uh, elements that don't deplete too much on the screens. And so that's what we've been doing, targeting these undepleted elements at redshift five, uh, around five and a little bit beyond five. And uh, this, did this, uh, these surveys were done with Magellan Mike, the LTX shooter, and also we used some archival KEK ESI data. And uh, the quasars are up to red chips of five and a half absorbers in that range. And with this, we measured the abundances of the undepleted elements, oxygen, sulfur, and also of, uh, some other elements like carbon and sometimes silicon, and uh, all with silicon, and sometimes also iron. And so we've nearly tripled the measurements of undepleted elements that are ships greater than four and a half. And this uh, is useful because some of the past studies use those uh, elements that can be depleted on this. So let me now talk about uh, what we find, first of all, for absorbers near the quasars from these uh, 
studies. So here is approximate sub DLA at redshift 5.34, and uh, it's apparent ejection velocity uh, divided by speed of light is about 0.01, so it's pretty close to the quasar. It is very metal poor, and uh, one can study its structure, determine the velocity dispersion of the gas, et cetera, and I'll talk about that in just a bit. Here are a couple of other absorbers uh, from our sample that are a little bit further out, but still could be associated with the quasar. And uh, they are considerably more metal rich. Here are a couple of other even further, uh, even higher redshift absorbers uh, that are also proximate DLS. These are from Deodor et al. 2018 and Manodos et al. 2019. And uh, these are again very close to the quasar, but quite metal poor. So if I collect our measurements as well as those from the literature and plot metallicity versus beta, uh, the apparent injection velocity divided by speed of light, uh, this is what the current picture looks like, as, at least uh, as far as I know. And so these are the, uh, you might think of beta less than 0.04 systems as the so-called associated systems. And further out, uh, perhaps there may be some contamination from associated systems, but uh, they're probably likely to be intervening uh, for the most part. So there's a wide range in uh, metallicities, ranging from a thousand solar to almost a quarter solar, even among the associated systems. And uh, maybe there are some trends here, but uh, it's, it's too small a sample, and uh, there are still outliers. Uh, the other plot here is a plot of metallicity versus H1 column density. and uh, so 20.3 would be the quote unquote boundary between sub DLAs and DLAs. Uh, but overall, there seems to be you know, comparable metallicities for these uh, different H1 ranges. And uh, again, there is a fairly wide range in metallicity. OK, so what do we learn about chemical evolution? So going further beyond just the regions near quasars, but going further out into the uh, general global uh, chemical evolution picture. Uh, some past studies had claimed that there's a sudden drop in metallicity at redshift greater than 4.7. And if such a drop exists, it would be surprising because there is no corresponding signature in the cosmic star formation history. So uh, one thing we wanted to check is whether that uh, is also seen when you use elements that don't deplete much on uh, interstellar dust grains. So here is a redshift five sub DLA. Now it is further out away from the quasar. Uh, 100 solar metallicity. So it's uh, metal poor, but not terribly metal poor. And there's a factor of 20 to 30 difference in abundance ratios and different uh, velocity components of this absorber. So for example, here you can see there's a lot of carbon, a lot of silicon, but no oxygen. And if you even add up all the components here, the ratio of silicon to oxygen is less than a third solar which is surprising considering both silicon and oxygen are alpha elements. So probably this means that silicon is indeed depleted in this absorber uh, by substantial amount. Some other absorbers from our study as well, and these are again further out. Uh, this one's metal rich, this one's not metal rich. So if we plot metallicity versus redshift, uh, these are the lower redshift DLAs and these are in fact binned data points. Each bin has a substantial number of DLAs. Uh, but these are all individual measurements. And uh, this includes our points, uh, previous points uh, from Rafalski et al., for example. Uh, also, more recent measurements, uh, like the ones I showed earlier. And uh, basically, the red point here is the H1 weighted metallicity, an H1 weighted metallicity of just these points. right? And these are uh, a little bit higher in redshift, but uh, it's not going to change the picture too much. The blue line is the uh, best fit from lower redshift. And the purple uh, point here is the simulation prediction from Finlater et al. 28. So the predicted and observed values seem to agree within less than one sigma. And we don't see a strong evidence of a sudden drop in metallicity at redshift greater than uh, 4.7 which is in fact actually consistent with uh, the GI of 2017. Uh, so some other quick trends, uh, silicon depletion versus metallicity, 
ion depletion versus metallicity and metallicity versus uh, velocity dispersion. And these are actually for uh, the samples presented in powder et al. So I think a few points are uh, need to be added more to these. But one can see that there is uh, depletion of iron and silicon for at least some objects. And uh, in general, uh, this may be true that the more metal poor you get, the more uh, the less depleted you are. But there are some objects that do show uh, significant depletion. The other interesting thing is the plot of metallicity versus dispersion, velocity dispersion, so velocity breadth of the line. And uh, there seems to be a uh, difference in the trend uh, that you normally see in lower redshift DLAs versus the higher redshift DLAs. And uh, not quite sure what that means. It may have a relation to a different mass metallicity relation between the two uh, populations of galaxies. It may mean perhaps that uh, the higher redshift galaxies are more dominated by dark matter and they have less stellar mass. Uh, but of course, the samples are too small to make too much out of this. And the last thing I want to touch on is the relative element abundances. So for example, here's carbon to oxygen versus oxygen to hydrogen. And uh, there's a lot of scatter here. Uh, but for comparison, I've shown here uh, the one and two dimensional projections of the posterior probability distributions of the progenitor star's mass, explosion energy, and stellar mixing parameter of the star uh, whose supernova explosion might have enriched the DLA at redshift 5.3. And uh, while we can't really constrain the mixing parameter much, uh, it seems like we can kind of uh, put some constraints on what range of progenitor masses uh, might have contributed the most to such a uh, such an observer's enrichment. And that comes out to be around 15 or 20 solar masses. Uh, in case you're interested, here is carbon to oxygen or carbon to sulfur versus absorption redshift. And uh, there is a substantial variation, but there are many subsolar carbon to oxygen uh, measurements here and no, uh, no neat, clear trend. So I'll just put up my conclusions here. Basically, the range of metallicities between both associated and intervening systems, both DLAs and sub-DLAs. Evolution does not show a certain drop. Uh, some systems do show dust depletion, and the metallicity velocity relation may be different. And ratios like carbon and oxygen, carbon to oxygen, and even silicon to oxygen uh, will be very important in the future. And obviously, we need to increase all these samples substantially more to check for trends more robustly. Thank you very much. Happy to answer any questions. Uh, so we have uh, time for a few questions. Uh, the yeah. first one is um, from Valentina Dodorico. For the low O1 sub-DLA at redshift 5, uh, uh, can the lack of O1 be due to an ionization effect? Yeah, let me come to that. Where is that? Can the lack of O1 be an ionization effect? Yes. Uh, we did look into this and we did correct for ionization uh, based on the measurements that we have. And even after correcting for ionization, we found that uh, there is this difference between silicon and oxygen. Uh, so indeed, some of the oxygen could be ionized. But I, uh, since we are using O1, we are actually not sensitive to ionization correction as much because of the O1 and H1 having similar ionization potentials. But I'll be happy to answer this more in detail on Slack. Thank you. Um, another question. Um, are there any hint of pop population-free yields? Sorry, can you please repeat are that? There, uh, are there any hints of population-free uh, enrichment? Any signatures of population three enrichment? Yeah, that's what we are uh, looking for. And hopefully, after comparing carbon to oxygen and silicon to oxygen, we can uh, make those kind of measurements better. But uh, the plot of metallicity versus redshift, uh, we did compare that to what are the predictions for models that do include population three versus they don't. And uh, there is not a, a lot of uh, defining uh, ability here. I, I wish I had that plot with me, but um, we can 
you know, the samples are still small, but as the samples get bigger, we can make more. And as we get to higher redshifts, eventually, at least for the relative abundances, we can uh, discern between the various population three uh, models, different IMFs, etc. Uh, thank you very much again. There are more questions online, so please have a look. Okay, thank you so much.